So now, put your faith in God and keep your powder dry. Hang on. Hang on. This is the what? black powder episode. Oh, yeah, you're right. Okay. I'll save that for later. Much, much later. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Brett, here with Daryl, and today uh, we're going to do a subject that uh, we've wanted to do for quite a long time. And quite simply, this is what every black powder shooter should know, needs to know, about the stuff itself, about black powder. And everything they also don't need to know. And a lot of stuff you probably don't need to know, but it will add to the context of why we do things and uh, hopefully will uh, give you a little more knowledge as you're deciding what commercial brands of black powder to buy today, what grain sizes of powder to use in uh, various antique and black powder firearms. But this has come up uh, actually by request. A lot of people have asked me to um, speak on this. Uh, and it, it kind of is sort of related to my day job. It is. Um, as a ammunition officer, as an ordnance officer in the army. And we'll get to that a little later with the modern use of black powder and why that's important. But um, in general, I just wanted to speak uh, probably longer than we need to. <laughs> <laughs> on the stuff because it is the it is the heart and soul of black powder shooting and a lot of shooters really don't know what the stuff is and what makes it special and why in the 21st century why we're still using it especially when there's substitutes available so for part one we're mostly going to be focusing on what the modern shooter the modern reenactor the modern person dealing with all these different black powders needs to know and then for part two we're gonna go really deep into the history of black powder in the 19th century yeah, I'll and try that'll to be the, the history as and, much as I can and that'll be on uh, FTG military history so for part two and for an even even deeper dive we'll uh, we'll go to our other channel but for now it's gonna be black powder black powder everything you need to know and then some and and then a little bit. So what is it? What is what is black powder? Who knows? It's a mystery substance. It's it's a flammable solid made up of three traditionally, not traditionally. always, but traditionally made up of three components. Um, you have the we'll start from the least important. The least important is the sulfur. So uh, you can make black powder without sulfur and at times uh, especially countries that didn't get access to it almost all the sulfur in europe came from uh, an island uh, in italy uh, the volcanoes yes um, of sicilian sicily and if you couldn't get access to that sulfur especially if you're the Emperor Napoleon, and you've been in war for years and years and years. If and the British won't let you for some reason. Navy out there, you can make black powder without sulfur. But the purpose of the sulfur, it helps bind the other components together, and probably most crucial, it lowers the ignition temperature of the powder. But it's it's the least important. The stuff will still work without it. Um, so for the other two, the saltpeter and the charcoal, which one would you say is more important? It's, they. They're both about the same because you wouldn't have black powder without one or the other. Uh, they, they have to go together. So black powder is essentially really, really, really quickly burning charcoal, period. That's all it is. The charcoal is the fuel. It gives you the combustible stuff that burns rapidly. And the saltpeter, the potassium nitrate, is a atom of potassium an atom of nitrogen and three of oxygen so that gives the oxygen to the charcoal so it's almost like blowing on a glowing ember you're really pumping oxygen into that combustion so the charcoal burns fast 
It's just black powder is really, really quickly burning charcoal. So it's it, primitive. And for a long time, for, for most of the human experience with firearms, it's all you had. So from the uh, 14th, 15th century until 1886, with some minor exceptions, and maybe we'll go into that in the history version. Um, gun cotton and some other things came around, but generally, broad brush, from the advent of firearms arriving in the 13, 1400s to 1886, it's all you have. And so all of these, all the wars, all the weapons, everything relies on charcoal that's just burning really, really quickly. So is that why it gets called a, a low explosive instead of a high explosive? Yes, because it uh, it doesn't create a shock wave when it burns. So it, instead of a detonation, which is a proper explosion that creates a shock wave, black powder just burns fast. So it deflagrates rather than detonates. So it's a low explosive. It just burns. Um, it's just a really, really quickly burning charcoal and by its nature it also is hygroscopic which simply means it sucks moisture out of the air and there's a couple ways to get around that we'll, we'll touch on that a little later um but it's it's the only thing only game in town for hundreds and hundreds of years so in the the manufacture of it it reached what i would argue the zenith of black powder production was the mid to late 19th century Absolutely. Uh, where they figured it out because again it's the only game in town so they would take the components the charcoal they knew exactly how to make it uh, normally it was cooked in in retorts and massive iron drums and they knew exactly how long to cook it with exactly how much heat uh, and the gunpowder makers at these factories like Waltham Abbey in uh, in the UK just by years and years and years of watching the stuff get made they knew by sight taste smell they knew what was right so it was 90 percent science but still like 10 percent art to some extent did, did the was, actual wood type matter yes yes crucially important um and we and, we learned that in the production yeah, there's the best kind of woods generally are willows, alder, poplar, but some woods are uh, far and away better than other woods. It and didn't matter. It, it's just the, the nature of the species of woods. Some have, when, when woods burn, some uh, woods are harder, close grained, others are. are uh, it's just that the nature of the wood, just by the species of it, determines how it burns. And you'll know if there's certain types, like if you throw a log of balsa wood on your fire, it's gonna go whoosh. If you put a big, dense piece of hickory, it's gonna take a long time mm -hmm. to burn. So just different species um, react in a, a different way. But they have they've figured all of this out by the 1840s, 1850s. And that's when they started pressing the powder. Uh, you like have this. some experience, yes. Yes. That is, that's what they would have called press cake. Now mine are round and those are hard. You probably tap two together and they sound like two plates. Like, yeah. Yep. So they would take, uh, they were in square boxes um, generally. The sides would unfold, but they would pack this, the mixture, very finely ground charcoal, the sulfur, the potassium nitrate ground, extremely fine, moistened, and then they would mill it for a long time with heavy stone wheels that would just grind over and over and over and over until it was completely integrated together. Then they would moisten that slightly and pack it into this press and squeeze it down. And um, basically that just gave you a much more durable grain of powder. And the industry standard, by the way, is 1.7 grams per cubic centimeter. Where's that powder measure? So if, if you have a powder measure, like this is just a cheap little commercial one, yeah. the grain markings on it, assume that the gunpowder you're measuring is 
1.7 grams per cubic centimeter, because this is a measure by volume, not by weight, but this scale knows how much black powder weighs given a certain volume because the industry standard 1.7 grams per cubic centimeter. So almost everything today assumes that it's pressed. Yes, but it everything wasn't pressed today is before pressed. the 19th century. Uh, not not always. Not no, always. They okay. started towards right at the turn of the 19th century is when it started being. It just has greater advantages. It's uh, it's denser. It doesn't degrade down into uh, dust as fast. And it, probably the best part, it takes up less space. So a barrel containing 60 pounds of gunpowder, before you started pressing it, it took a much bigger barrel. So on your ships, if you need to store hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pounds of powder, you're taking up more and more and more Ooh. space. Um, the density of powder also affects its burn rate. This becomes even more important like in the late 19th century, start getting into cartridge guns when they start tinkering with, well, how dense can we make it? Yeah. Because you have to fit this powder into a cartridge case. Um, but that 1.7 grams per cubic centimeter is the... Um, so your 18th century yeah. cartridges might have looked quite a bit bigger. They were, yes. Yeah. Um, still the same amount of powder. Yeah. So it's... Because it's a by point, weight. Right. It's by weight. Um, but it's it's just takes up more space. When you press the powder, you get those press cakes, as they're called. I call them pucks, the yeah. ones that I made. I, I believe you, you've referred to them as happy rocks. But, no, but I don't think I have. <laughs> certainly not. <laughs> Never in your capacity fake, as fake an ordinance officer no. have you referred to pressed powder as happy rocks. And but, I certainly have never thrown one of those into a campfire at the beginning. No. But, so let's continue the, the process at the factory. So they've milled all the, pro, all the uh, product together. They've pressed them into these giant tiles. Right. Now what? Now you just bust them up. And the grain size you get after you bust up those hard cakes, that's your grain size. So your one up, your two up, your three up, the, you break that up. And it would be sifted through a series of meshes. And so, uh, and the mesh size, at least in the English speaking world, is, is you know, number of holes in the mesh per inch. So, um, the powder I like to use, uh, the, the English rifle fine grain, which is what the Enfield rifle, yeah. you know, circa 1860 was using, the powder for that would fall through a mesh with 16 meshes to an inch, but it would be stopped by 20 meshes per inch. So that gave you the grain size. And so today that would roughly correspond to about a 1F powder, um, just by what fits between you know, 16 and 20 um, meshes per inch. So we're sifting, sifting, sifting. The, the larger grain being the 1F, the small being the 3F, and smaller. Mm -hmm. But you eventually get the dust. And there's also dust through the um, other processes that it goes through. But what, what happens to that dust? Is any of that lost? No, you just you sweep it up. All the stuff that doesn't fit within the various sizes. So your 1F, 2F, 3F, 4F. If it doesn't fit through any of those mesh sizes, it just gets swept up and it goes right back into the mill, you grind it back down again, you damp it down again, you put it back in the press, so it just gets recycled. Reduce, so reuse, recycle in the 19th century. And this is, this is for propellant, uh, which is what we, as black powder shooters, we use this stuff as a, um, a propellant to drive a projectile down a barrel. We, today, Black powder is recreational, but in the mid 19th century, you know, in 1850, this was the cutting edge. Everything, all of our military technology depends on this stuff. And it had to be consistent. And it had to be very good, yeah. because if the enemy got had a better powder than you, you're uh, at a at a marked disadvantage. So there's a lot of research. Um, and it, again, it is what drives the bullet that 
destroys the enemy on the battlefield. Um, and it becomes really, really, really important right around uh, 1851. Because something changes. Something changes. For some reason. Military technology. Somebody keeps wanting to rifle all these muskets. Yes. So, so how, how does the, uh, what needs to change about black powder for them to be used in rifles, if anything? With a smoothbore, well, think about it. We're just shooting brown bess. Yep. How, how, how tight does that ball fit in brown bess? It just bounces down. Just, yeah. You could even spit the ball down the barrel. Bite, pull, spit, tap, in. Bad, bad, <laughs> terrible. Please don't. We did a whole video on that. Your powder can be pretty cruddy, and yeah. it's still going to drive the bullet, and it might leave a bunch of fouling residue in your barrel, but who cares because you have a 75 caliber gun, and you're dropping a 67 caliber bullet yep. down it. Once you have a rifle, now the bullet fits tightly in the barrel and you need to have the capability of reloading it from the muzzle again and again and again. So suddenly now you need a black powder that has uh, maximum propelling power. So you want to have, you, you've got a rifle. So it's the sights on some of these rifles go, black powder rifles go to a thousand yards. You want the maximum power out of this chemical propellant substance and you want minimal fouling so that it, it pushes the ball as hard and as far as it can and it leaves behind the minimal residue and they've tested this just ad nauseum in every country um, test after test after test the proportions how much charcoal how much potassium nitrate how much sulfur but most importantly, sulfur is sulfur, potassium nitrate is potassium nitrate. It doesn't, you, you can get it, you know, pure, yeah. and that's it. Nothing else changes about it. But charcoal, not all charcoals are equal. So the finest willow charcoal made in a, a retort a certain way versus a, the briquettes at, you know, the Kroger, yeah. big difference. It's all charcoal, but one of them will work really well for you in a black powder gun, and one of them's going to go blah. And they figured out by the uh, by about 1850 which charcoal, which types of wood were best, and the answer they came up with was dogwood. They also called it the alder buckthorn. That is the best wood, or almost the best. We're ironic to live. Uh, I know. Fortunate, I guess I should say. Just an irony of geography. Yeah native to where we live in Southern California is Pacific Willow. That's technically the best wood for making black powder out of. So the powder we make is made from Pacific Willow. And it, you really do notice the it's difference. It's almost smokeless. It's yeah. scary. You're like, no, that, that, can't, that yeah. can't be right because it's so clean. But it is closer to those historical conditions. Yes. Um, and the alder buckthorn is, is very similar. So it's got... Uh, it leaves behind very little residue. Um, it, it doesn't create anywhere near as much smoke. But the most important aspect of it is how much more gas it creates. So alder buckthorn produced gunpowder makes 10% more gas than an equal weight of the next best powder. So like a willow powder. And... Uh, Joseph Louis Proust? Proust. Proust. French scientist. He was one of many, but he, he, he did the, published his results that were widely studied in, in England and then later, uh, not as much, but in the United States as well. He just took a known measure of each of these types of gunpowders made with different types of wood. So willow, alder, poplar, the dogwood, and he scientifically tested them in the laboratory to see how much gas is created when I ignite these. And the equal weights of each of them, the dogwood produced something like 84 cubic inches. 
Um, the dogwood made the most gas, and then the next best powder willow was 10% less, and then down from there. Wow. So um, it gives you the, the best powder you can have with this. And that's what they were making, the English powders, the best powder today. There are still people alive today who can tell you about Curtis and Harvey's black powder, English made, um, and, and some people still have care. I know some who still have carefully hoarded stocks of it, made with this um, wood with the old English methods. It was just now. Let me ask you this: the best. Before we get into talking about the specific brands, do any companies advertise the kind of wood they use for their charcoal? Swiss, Swiss, Swiss powder. You go to their website. They right there first. Not the first thing they say, but okay. most people will be like, what? <laughs> but if you, and it's not really in the fine print, it's actually, yeah. we proudly make our powder using alder buckthorn. Wow. Right there on their website. So, um, it's. And, and so we can assume if they aren't talking about their alder buckthorn, they probably aren't they're probably using, not using it because they I might know, not be using but, pallet wood, but they're probably not using yeah, alder buckthorn. Um, so, I hate to break it to you, but if, with the exception perhaps of Swiss, the powders that we have today are not the equivalent in strength uh, and uh, fouling Maybe as the, the powders press board. in the 19th century. It's just, they had better powder. I hear it frequently. Um, comments will be made, well, they had they didn't have as good powder back then, which is, is, is just frankly, categorically and historically not true. They had better powder than we have today. Um, for black powder. For Yes, for, for black powder. Um, and we'll kind of get into the reasons why at the end. And so that's when, that's why when you do, um, you know, the velocity tests and all, all those sort of experimental archeology, span we try to use Swiss or the RFG. Yeah. And it'll perform yeah. a lot closer. And you know how we know Swiss is very close to the British rifle fine grain powder? Because we have a chronograph. I yes. said chronometer. Not the chronometer. We're trying to find our, our longitude. Yes. We have a chronograph. We have the rifles. And we have. And we have the bullets made exactly the same way. So they're pressed, with, not cast. With, with the correct plugs. plugs. With the exactly the right, so we weigh the powder, and when we shoot it through the chronograph, we get exactly the same velocity. The exact one. That two, was two shocking per to second. see that. So that tells us, as you know, what well, it was, it was 1264? 1264. Yeah. Yeah. And um, it varied in the period sources, it varies by about 20, 30 feet per second. Yeah. But it was still pretty day, shocking to see the actual... Yeah, it was one yeah. test in 1865 got 1264 on the yeah. nose, and we yeah. get 1264, same rifle, same bullet, same powder. With the Swiss. Right, and yeah. with Go-X, it's about 100 feet per second slower. So it was it was the best. So if you, if you want to get near equivalent to the 19th century awesome powder they had, you got to use Swiss. So this, this is where it gets a little technical. Um, so we, we measure the powders with conventionally, at least in the United States, with the scale, the F scale. So yeah. the more Fs you have, F stands for fine. So if it's just fine powder, one F, it's what we would call large grains. Yeah. Um, 2F, a little smaller, 3F, even smaller, 4F is really small, 5F is practically dust. Um, that's the system that we, we use uh, in, with sporting powder. In the military, at least with the US Army, I'm assuming it's military, uh, it's, it's a class system. So a, like a class seven powder is like a 4F, and a class one powder would be very large like almost cannon yeah. grade um, size. And sporting powder, most sporting powder 
is indicated by the G. So your good old Go X, you know, FF is a little lowercase G. Sometimes good. it's uppercase. Yeah, it, uh, it, it stands for G gunpowder. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Um, what is the G? It's the G simply means this is powder for sporting purposes. Um, it's it's the classification. I'm it's not sporting entirely... as opposed to blasting. So blasting powder would have A, and it it still you can use the F system. So you could have F F F A powder, but that's not a sporting powder. You actually need a different license to buy it and to sell it. It's just it's the same stuff. It's just there's how does it act differently? Blasting powder versus sporting powder? It's it's not so the, the little lowercase g means the powder has been glazed. Uh, and that's simply to mean they take the powder, so you bust up your little hockey pucks, you break those down, you put them through the mesh, and then now you've got grains of the correct approximate size for your purpose. They're not equally shaped. Some of them are really jagged and pointy and sharp. So you take all of those, throw them in a drum, and you just tumble them at low speed, and that knocks off the sharp edges. And what it leaves you is grains of gunpowder that look like gunpowder. So they're more rounded, pebble-shaped instead of jagged and sharp. Like, a, you know, like if you drop a dinner plate on the ground, it's not gonna give you a bunch of nice, round, yeah. even grains. So the G, indicates it has gone through this process to knock off those sharp edges. And there's a, a couple smart reasons for why you want to do that. Um, one of them, just simply, if you have all those sharp edges in a you know, can of powder or in cartridges, if those are knocked around and banged around, it's going to knock those sharp edges off, those little bits sticking out, and it's going to create dust. That dust, now you're going to have your large pieces of powder, then a whole bunch of little fine dust in the same char, that's going to affect the um, curve, the pressure curve yeah. when it burns. And you're also in barrels and containers, you're going to get this dust at the bottom that's kind of worthless. So if you're paying for 100 pounds of powder and you end up with five pounds of dust at the yeah. bottom of the keg, you're kind of like, what the heck? This is useless to me. Um, and it also will measure by volume a lot easier without those sharp edges. So yeah. you can pour, it'll pour much more like a fluid as opposed to uh, having those, those sharp edges. Occasionally, and this is the case with most modern commercial powders, not so much with the historic powders, um, but some of them were graphite glazed. So a very small amount of graphite will be added into that tumbling barrel that slowly knocks all the sharp edges off. And that will coat the grains in a very thin, like microns level thin coating of graphite. Um, it does raise the ignition temperature, but it will, it really does have an incredible effect in preventing it from absorbing moisture out of the atmosphere. So it lowers how hygroscopic the powder is. So and it historically, flows. it didn't have that graphite on it, which means that is why my flintlock keeps not going off and definitely not because my flints are terrible you just yeah you can that's actually i was about to say you can keep telling yourself that but that might be true it might be because the um the brown best era powder was not graphite you, you really wanted the lowest possible ignition temperature you don't want anything getting in the way of that spark and the powder igniting mm -hmm. and the graphite would form a barrier um, but uh, you know, my powder I don't graphite glaze it so it will absorb. Well, that was always the most terrifying process part of the process was tumbling finished powder from from a healthy distance <laughs> yeah a very healthy distance yes it was like a 10 inch shell that we watched you know <laughs> oh there's that spinning 10 inch shell over there yeah, but it was what, at least 100 feet away yeah, what's, yeah, fine. <laughs> well, what's the blast range of a 10-inch <laughs> <a> shell? <laughs> so we have the, the G, we have the graphite coating. That doesn't get involved in blasting powder, though. 
No, uh, most blasting powder will not be tumbled. Okay. Or, or if it is, not as long. So they might tumble it for a shorter amount of time. Just, okay, good enough. Because it's not, blasting powder is not being metered out in small little doses. You know, and you don't need that consistency in. for the expanding bullet or anything like that. No, no, it's not. And blasting powder is just... It's for blasting. They're literally blasting. It's a blast. Um, this is probably the main reason why I wanted to make this video. So that I could so, say it's a blast? No, that was the second reason. Okay. It's the question I get, or the advice I see given to people on which grain size, so like 3F, 2F, 1F, which one you should use, and the misconception about what the differences are. If I had a dollar for every time I saw someone say 3F burns faster than 1F, I, I wouldn't be doing this. <laughs> I'd be on my yacht somewhere. It's the same stuff. So if you've got a pound of 1F GoX and you've got a pound of 3F GoX, they both weigh one pound. And it's the same stuff. It was literally came off of the same press cakes that came out of the press, broken down. It could have even been made on the same day from the same batch. The only difference is how large the pieces of gunpowder are. It is the same stuff. There's no chemical difference between 1F and 3F. So therefore, a pound of 1F powder faster than 1F. I, I wouldn't be doing this. <laughs> I'd be on my yacht somewhere. It's the same stuff. So if you've got a pound of 1F GoX and you've got a pound of 3F GoX, they both weigh one pound and it's the same stuff. It was literally came off of the same press cakes that came out of the press, broken down. It could have even been made on the same day from the same batch. The only difference is how large the pieces of gunpowder are it is the same stuff. There's no chemical difference between 1F and 3F. So therefore, a pound of 1F powder has exactly the same potential energy as a pound of 3F or a pound of 5F. Or um, even if you had a pound of solid pucks and a pound of 4F, they each have the same amount of energy. There's still one pound of black powder there. The only difference is that one of them, the pieces are smaller. So with, with the, the pucks, this might be like minus 60 F. It's, so this could be one grain, yep. right? This is the surface area that this one grain of powder, because this is one piece of powder. Yep. It's got this much surface area. Now, if you were to bust this up into powder to the size of 3F, it would have exponentially more surface area because every little grain has surface area around it. So the difference between 1F and 3F powder, the 1F has less surface area. There's more larger pieces of black powder. 3F has, or, uh, there's fewer, but they're larger pieces of powder in 1F. 3F, you've got more smaller pieces of powder, and that means you have more surface area. So when the black powder in a gun gets ignited, it burns, it's, it's called a degressive burn. So it burns from the outside in. It catches fire. The outside catches fire first, and it burns down until it's gone. If you've got a lot more smaller grains, that greater surface area starts burning and it, it, it consumes itself sooner. The powder itself does not burn any faster. If, if you were to light this piece of black powder on the side, it would take a little while for it to burn not that across. We've tried. Yeah, we wouldn't know. We would never do that. But it would, t it, it's burning at the same rate 
as it would if you broke it up into tiny little grains and set one grain on fire. It's just the only difference is that this larger piece would take more time, clock time, seconds, to be consumed than if you busted it up into tiny pieces, then it would go poof, no eyebrows. Ask me how I know. <laughs> it does not burn any faster. 3F doesn't intrinsically consume itself faster than black powder that's made into 1F. It's the same stuff. So I, I, I see it constantly. Uh, you know, oh, use a faster powder, use 3F, it, it burns faster. That might be true in, if, you're, if you're talking about time, but, but they're, they're not. Most of the time, they believe 3F powder is hotter. I heard them say, oh, 3F is hotter than 1F. It's got, somehow it has more power, and that's not true. 60 grains of 1F and 60 grains of 3F are equally hot, so to speak. One doesn't have any more energy. Why would you want a more smaller grains of powder like 3F as opposed to fewer larger grains and what applications? When do you really want all the powder to be completely consumed in a short period of time? For? Think of barrel lengths. If you had a really long barrel, like a musket. Oh yeah. 36 inch barrel. Then you need something closer to one. Yeah, you can use 1F powder because it is going to be it, it takes a little longer for those grains to consume themselves. And it needs to burn the whole way up. But it will fully consume itself in the amount of time it takes the bullet to move down that barrel. If you've got a short little pistol, you need to give that bullet a, as much propelling powder as you can in as short a clock time as possible because the bullet's gonna leave the barrel. Once it leaves the, the muzzle, it doesn't matter how much powder you have in the chamber, it doesn't matter what size the grains are, that's wasted energy. You want to deliver as much energy as you possibly can in that short amount of time it takes the bullet to move down the barrel. So there's no advantage to using 3F powder in a 58 caliber rifle musket barrel over 1F. Uh, the only difference is that the powder is going to be consumed faster. 1F will be consumed in a longer amount of time but if, if you're if imagine you know how much the p53 kicks with the service charge 58 grains or brown best with six trams of powder that's 1f imagine using 3f how <laughs> much more so your recoil increases it's it's far less pleasant to shoot and in the 1850s they realized we don't need this fine grain powder the larger grain 1f size rifle fine grain it's between 16 and 20 mesh size works perfectly for this length of barrel but that's that's my pet peeve is that 3f is hotter or it's faster burning than 1f it's all black powder it burns at the same rate no matter how how large or small you bust it up into. Is that a good rant? It is a good rant. <laughs> so why is there this, this uh, feeling that using a, you know, a cartridge with 3F uh, it could be dangerous? Is it because of the um, potential volume difference of 3F versus I, 1F? I think so. I think where the, where this, where this myth probably started was someone used a volumetric powder measure, which is normally intended for like one or two F powder, especially a rifle size one. And if they, if they set this to, you know, 70 grains and they fill it with four F powder, the, the volumetric measure assumes there's gonna be airspace with larger grains, like two F or three F powder, if you fill it up with very fine powder, you're going to get a larger weight than you thought you had. So it's possible they might have loaded that up thinking, oh no, I'm only loading 70 grains, when in reality you were loading more. And that could have burst um, a barrel. And, and that's where we get so many of those indiscretions is because most of the powder measurements, even the historical ones, are by weight. All, yeah. A dram so, is a yeah, is weight. A dram is a dram is a dram. Yeah. 
So and modern modern is not that I'm going and encouraging people to go. In fact, I'm doing the opposite. I'm encouraging people to use the large grain. Use one F in fifty caliber rifles and above, because that's what they're designed for. It's the it's the best powder to use in, in a long barrel. I'm not saying go out and, and load 60 grains of 5F and see what happens. You're probably going to, might even split your stock. Yeah. Because it's, it, the recoil is going to be uh, nasty. But if, if you were to put this, and, and these weighed like 300 something grains each puck. If you were to put this in a sealed vacuum container and ignite it, and measure how much gas was produced, and then take an identical puck, grind it down into 5F powder, and ignite it, you would get exactly the same amount of produced gas because it does the amount of energy stored in here doesn't change based on how big or small the particles of it are. It can only hold X amount of energy regardless of whether it's a one solid chunk or a whole bunch of tiny little pieces. The only difference is how quickly it is consumed. So a, a 3F or 4F powder, once it's ignited, it's all gonna be burned, it's all gonna be gone in a shorter amount of time than a 1F powder. Um, but they all burn generally fast whether it's it's 1F or 4F, it, it burns quickly. And that is what we as black powder shooters really like about black powder. This is the unique quality of it that enables us to use our favorite types of bullets. Expanding bullets. Expanding bullets. The best kind. What, are, what is your favorite expanding bullet? The maxi ball or the trash can? <laughs> I thought that was going to be a serious question. <laughs> that was good. But by by expanding, we don't mean hollow points that expand, that are terminally expanding. We mean a, a muzzle loader bullet like the Minier ball or Burton bullet, um, or even like the Pritchett or the, the compression bullet. Or the Williams bullet. Any, any expand, any bullet that is smaller than the size of the barrel that expands into the barrel when you fire it, the unique qualities of black powder, get it there. Um, black powder has an a almost sledgehammer-like effect on a soft piece of lead in a barrel. It, it applies an incredible amount of energy in a very short period of time. Sledgehammer, you say? Yes. Have you tested this? With a sledgehammer? Yes, in, in theory. So I think you've tested it in I, practice. Oh, ow! You've been sledgehammering lead for science. So I, I cast this, yeah, for science, and um, set it on the concrete. And this is quite heavy. So this is a object at rest, right? And it's heavy. Who was it? Newton. Is, it, is this Newton? one of those guys? One of those guys? Probably Newton. I think it was Newton. He says an object at rest wants to stay at rest and an object in motion wants to stay at motion. So this is an object at rest. So the bullet in your barrel is an object at rest with considerable mass. This is where things get really weird. The things that go on inside a gun barrel after you pull the trigger, it, it, it's, it's, it defies like common sense so to speak but it stands this, to reason this shows this test i did demonstrates the effect so it takes more energy to make this object at rest move forward than it does to actually displace the lead and cause it to move or bend or spread um so in in your rifle barrel, imagine this is a bullet, and you strike it with a sledgehammer of burning black powder creating 3,000 plus PSI in a very short period of time. The lead, so when I, when I hit this with the sledgehammer, you can actually see the lead itself moving and displacing before the piece starts moving forward. 
so you can watch the sledgehammer come in and the lead itself moves the the bar of lead bent even as it's starting to move forward so it took less energy to bend this lead than it did to cause it to move this phenomenon we call it in the united states we call it bumping up um, what just like yeah, it's, it's, yeah, no, your black powder bullets are going to bump up in, oh. in, in the 18 and 19th century. They called it upsetting both in the yes. United States and in Europe. Pritchett so bullets are they upset. being upset, but trash it's can the same, minis. They bump up. They bump up. <laughs> it's, it's the same theory. It's, it's that a soft metal projectile, it's like soft lead. When you fire it in a barrel, it's going to compress in on itself and bump up or upset and fill your rifling. You don't get this effect, though, with a black powder substitute. You get it from real, genuine black powder um, for, for one chief reason. So black powder substitutes are... Um, essentially modern propellants that are dumbed down so that their burning speed is slow enough that they can be classified by the Department of Transportation as a um, smokeless powder and not black powder. Black powder has its own specific transportation regulations because of the flame spread. The beauty of black powder, this is what, this is why we still use it in many military applications is how fast it spreads flame from one particle to the other. So when it, in your um, in your black powder gun, cap lock gun, say P53 Enfield for sake of argument, you pull the trigger, you drop the hammer, the cap ignites and it sends the flame down into the chamber. The flame propagates through that entire charge and ignites every single grain of powder in your rifle musket barrel at a speed of 1300 feet per second. That's faster than the speed of sound. That's fast. That's how fast flame from one particle of black powder jumps to its neighbor. And uh, we know now that it's, it's burning, it's high temperature salts of potassium. When black powder starts burning, there's a chemical reaction and these extremely hot bits of potassium salts are being spat away at 1300 feet per second, faster than the speed of sound. And they touch their neighbor and infect it. And the whole thing goes viral in an incredibly short amount of time. Um, so in, in a P53 infield, so you take 68 grains of powder and in the chamber of a gun, it's a uh, Chamber of the infield, it's a little bit less than an inch. That's how long that cylinder of powder is in your barrel. From the first particle of gunpowder igniting to the very last particle of gunpowder igniting is one fifteen thousand six hundredth of one second. That's how fast wow. all of that gunpowder is burning in one. 15,600th of one second. And that's how you can lose all your arm hair in one day. <laughs> Not that that's ever happened. I think you lost your eyebrows once too because you were filming and you were looking up the touch no, hole of brown vest. No, no. no. That was... I... Oh, wait. Yes. 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 <laughs> I forgot about that. Yeah. And it was with my camera too. <laughs> you really wanted to catch the I mean, it wasn't, flash. it wasn't the whole eyebrow, but there was a lot of singed hair. Yes. And after that, oh. he said, my goodness, the flame spread on that black powder is That's really exactly what remarkable. I said. Remarkable. That's what, exactly what I said. Um, but it's, it's just, it all, now when I say it's, it catches fire, that doesn't mean the powder has been burned away. That just means it has caught on fire. So, and, and so one, you know, one fifteen thousandth of a second for all intents and purposes might as well be damn near instantaneous. It's not, there's a span of time, but we can say, you know, generally speaking, the powder, all of their powder is burning instantaneously. Once that cap goes off, it's all burning 
damn near the same instant of time. Um, you know, with, with sub, way sub microseconds, you know, one fifteen thousandths of a second. Um, and that's the awesome quality of black powder. So it's all burning and it, as the pressure increases, the burn rate of the powder, this is how quickly it consumes itself, increases. The higher the pressure, the faster the gunpowder itself wants to burn. So it's just um, chain reaction, probably not the right term. Again, I'm not a scientist. Just historians. I'm a history major and a logistics officer. But it, as the pressure increases, the rate of burn, this is actually how quickly the black powder is burning. And it's a degressive burn, so it burns from the outside of the grain in until the powder's um, gone. Um, but at 3,000 feet per second, so at chamber pressure of a black powder rifle, um, for instance, a grain of 1F powder is gone. It's completely burned in 1 300th of one second. And that is before in a 36 some inch barrel of your rifle muskets, like a P53, that one half grain of powder is gone. It is totally burned. It has converted itself into energy. And the, uh, you know, only 43% of the products of combustion of black powder is gas. Everything else is a solid. And mm -hmm. half of that's left inside your barrel as yes. a lovely black ooze. But it that doesn't. one, that one grain of, that little speck of 1F powder is gone before the bullet leaves the muzzle. So it has converted itself into energy and it's delivered every bit of the energy it's got. That 68 grain charge has given every potential bit of energy it can. And so the barrel is now full of a hot gas driving the bullet. So there's no need to use a 3F powder because the one F is still consumed before the bullet leaves the barrel. Um, why would you really want to use three F and just give yourself a sharper recoil and risk stripping, which is uh, the phenomenon of a bullet that gets, it, it moves in such a way that it doesn't actually grip the rifle in when it expands. It just rides over the top of yeah. the grooves. So it's that rapid flame spread and then the relatively quick burning of the powder that is what gives the punch to these to, to a mini ball. That's what expands the skirt out. It's what compresses a Wilkinson style compression bullet. Uh, it's what drives the plug forward in a Williams bullet. It's this sharp you know, sledgehammer like shock effect. And you don't get that with the black powder substitutes. Like the Pyrodex, just by its very nature, you don't, you get equivalent energy created, but the time and way it is created doesn't have that kick. The black powder just takes that piece of lead and kicks it. So before the bullet even starts really moving down the barrel, it's already been squashed and expanded and swelled into your rifle and takes the spin and that's why it works so well. Um, Pyrodex can work great in cartridge guns shooting patched round ball out of rifles it'll work well but it doesn't work quite as well with expanding bullets like uh, mini balls it can and the 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 tighter fitting the bullets are the more likely it will but um, not as well as the the real genuine black powder now you mentioned modern military applications of black powder let's talk about my favorite one that actually has to do with how fast it actually burns. Let's talk about black powder in the artillery. How many pounds of black powder does the United States Army use every year? I haven't any idea. About a million pounds of black powder. <laughs> and I'm, I'm assuming <laughs> that those aren't just for ceremonial purposes. Some of it is, but nowhere near a million pounds. Um, so what's the application? There's, it's, it's widespread because black powder has so many awesome qualities. We use it as a propellant. So we shoot black powder guns. We want a powder that 
creates the maximum amount of propellant gas and leaves behind the least amount of fouling. That's what we want. Um, the army and, and the military, militaries of the world, um, value the black powder for its other qualities and especially the flame spread. It's very stable. Like I mentioned, some people have cans of Curtis and Harvey's sitting on their shelf. And as long as you keep it sealed up, it doesn't readily decompose. It'll last for a really long time. And every so often you hear about someone who blows themselves up when they dig up a parrot shell from the Civil War and somehow it explodes. Um, the powder is still good in there. It's very stable. It's very cheap. It's very good for the army. We like cheap stuff. And it has a very low ignition temperature. So uh, you've got this substance that's stable, it's cheap, and it all catches fire really, really fast and it ignites at a low temperature. You can use that for a lot of different applications. So we use them in the, the fuse trains, like uh, the delays on fuses um, for uh, artillery. Uh, it's probably the largest single use is in um, artillery propellant charges. So we, this is a the artillery we're using does not use black powder to push the shells out. No, it's using a modern propellant. But this, it's important to make sure all of the propellant is ignited at pretty much the same time. So if you fire a big artillery piece and your uh, your primer is at the very back, at the breech of the gun, and you've got all of this propellant here, if you ignite it from the very rear, then you're gonna get a kind of a, a progressive burn from the back up to the front. So all the powder in front is gonna be getting pushed by the burning stuff in the back, and it's gonna give you a real uneven pressure curve, and it's not ideal. What you really want is you want to ignite all of that propellant you want to get it all burning at pretty much the same time so that it all burns at, at, at a, a much, um, it's just, it's better to have it all burning at once instead of from one end to the other. So I'm gonna have a charge of black powder. Some, uh, some of the powder bags for the, the heavier artillery has a tube of black powder running down the middle of it, or it'll have a pad at the base so that the primer fires, it ignites the black powder, and the black powder goes, blasts throughout the charge, and it ignites all of the propellant, you know, again, almost instantaneously. That The flame spread qualities of that black powder are just, uh, you still today, 2021, you can't beat it. We're still, we're shooting terrorists somewhere um, with artillery shells, that have been propelled with propellant that was ignited by really, really quickly pieces of burning charcoal. That is fascinating. And to the tune of a million pounds a year. So um, why do black powder shooters need to know that? It's because the preeminent gunpowder manufacturer in the United States, the only one, by the way, GoEx is the only commercial black powder manufacturer in the United States. Do you know where they're located? Georgia? No, Louisiana. Louisiana, okay. They're on what used to be until recently the Minden Army Ammunition Plant. And their number one biggest customer is the United States military. Yeah. They make a million pounds a year to the military. And it's made to a mill. There is a mill spec for black powder. There's a mill spec for charcoal. Uh, the mill spec is... Mill P two two three B. That's the U.S. government says black powder black, and it says this is what the stuff is. This is what we need, and GoEx provides it for all the the fuse trains and um, um, pyrotechnics. So all the training aids, like when you were running around an ROTC and they drop an artillery sim on your position, or if I'm an OCS and I just made this beautiful sand table and I'm about to brief it to my squad to go do my mission. And uh, um, I won't mention his name. We call him Captain Nogo. Captain Nogo comes walking up and drops an arty sim right in the middle of my beautiful <laughs> sand table I just spent an hour making and it all just gets blown to sand. Well, that's 
<laughs> black powder in that artillery sim. But most of it goes for um, the, the propellant. That's some artillery charges use up to a pound of black powder each in them. But the US military doesn't care how much fouling is left behind in their, by the burning powder. They don't care. Uh, they don't care um, how much gas is created by this burning charcoal because it's irrelevant. They're not, they're not using black powder as a propellant. We as black powder shooters use it as a propellant to drive a projectile down the barrel. The US military's uses of it today could care less about how good a propellant it is. The, we want consistency. So GoX, and, and we don't really officially know what type, what type of charcoal GoX uses. It's probably a maple blend. That's because they can make it extremely consistently. Um, GoEx stands for Gerhardt Owen Explosives. It used to be DuPont, it used to be made in um, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. Then it blew up. When it was being made in Pennsylvania, they were getting their charcoal from a, from a company, a local company. When they moved to Louisiana, they started getting it from a different company. And they made their charcoal the same wood. They were using the same wood, but they just made it in a different way. And there are papers um, that are uh, they're, they're not classified. They're released for uh, public domain, so I'm not spilling any national secrets. But in the 70s, when GoEx moved to Louisiana and they started making their powder with, this, with another company's charcoal, they made it using a slightly different process. We noticed artillery shells falling short. So you call for artillery fire in training. It's not like that we're dropping rounds on people, you know, danger close in combat. But in training, you call for fire and you want those rounds dropped on this spot, on these coordinates, and they fall like 50 meters short. And they're, why the heck is that? Everything is the same. And they realized they traced it down to the burn rate changed in the black powder from the different method of making the charcoal. So it, it changed how quickly it ignited the propellant in the chamber of the artillery piece, which changed the trajectory of the shell by a tiny, tiny, tiny amount. But at 16 miles away, the difference came out to many meters. That's that, awesome though. And that's, because of the change. Because of the charcoal. So the charcoal, so GoX makes their black powder to this mill spec, mill P223B. Yep. They make it with the type of wood that gives the most consistency because that's what their number one customer of the United States military wants. So they also make it for commercial or for sporting shooters. And we shoot it. And for a long time, it was the only game in town. GoX was pretty much all there was. If you wanted to go shoot black powder guns, you had GoX, and we didn't know any better. We we for decades we just assumed this is what you know we have. More recently, we've had more options. You know, there was um, elephant powder came out of Brazil for a while. I dearly miss. Where's my kick? Uh, out of um, Slovenia, I think it was. This stuff is great. It's not being imported anymore. I don't know why. It's probably some evil government conspiracy. Uh, we'll make a video about that later. <laughs> but I loved kick powder. Uh, it's, it's no longer being imported. But uh, today we do have a few more choices. Schutzen out of Germany. And then, of course, um, Swiss and GoX. And GoX has... Uh, you know, in the last decade or so, old Einsford, it's supposed to be their more premium grade, but they don't say what type of charcoal they make it out of. So I don't know. I don't, yeah. I don't know if they're using a willow. I don't know if it's a, I, I don't know. They, they haven't said. Now, I think if they were using a really high grade of charcoal, like Swiss was, Swiss on their website, it might even say it on the can. No, I guess not. Um, 
But if you go to their website, all their buckthorn, they're proud of it. Like we spend the time and money to buy this wood. It's aged for three years and dried, uh, you know, it, it, and Swiss lets you know because they, <laughs> it's not cheap. But I don't know, I would assume if Goex was making Old Einsford out of a similar, really nice wood for um, making black powder charcoal, they'd say so. So their silence speaks volumes, I guess you could say. But Goex, it works. Yeah, you can load 60 grains of it in a rifle musket and it's gonna drive a bullet, but it's not the best. It's not made Goex. Again, we're probably gonna get lots of angry outraged comments. Goex, plain old red label Goex is not a, made as a propellant. It's made to a mill spec for another application that just happens to work in black powder guns, but it's not ideal. It's not made as a propellant. And it's not made with the same, you know, ingredients as it was historically. And no. the closest one yeah. to that is either RFG that you make with California willow in the backyard or <laughs> Swiss. And I just buy the Swiss now because it is so making black powder is fun. It is so much it's filthy and an <laughs> incredible amount of work. Now to do it right, to actually to mill it down and then to press it. And then once you get those, those are probably four years old now. It's so much work to bust them up, and then it's yeah. so much work to sift them through the grain sizes. And the sizes. whole process is dangerous. It's, well, the dragon bites. Keep him keep small. Keep him small. That's been my motto. I still have all my fingers yes. and most of my eyebrows. Yes. <laughs> so let's have a conversation about it, skirmish. Let's talk to. about skirmish. For reenactors are weird. They're weird people. I know. But they probably want to know about skirmish black powder. Skirmish is just the the leftovers that don't fit neatly into. Remember, we discussed the the excess gets gathered back up and it goes right back into the mill and then it gets repressed again. Because um, this really is an application that's neither propellant nor the right. military application. Yeah, this, this is this is smoke and noise. Yeah, this is noise powder. <laughs> yes. So. <laughs> But I have used it for live fire with rifles, and, and I've, I've had surprisingly good results with it. Because uh, kind of how you, how you talked about your, uh, you know, the, that the grain size doesn't necessarily matter if it all burns the entire way down yeah, the barrel. You certainly wouldn't win any black powder shooting competitions with it no but if you're plinking and we shoot at really big targets like four foot square still targets at 300 yards you'll yeah. you'll still hit it uh, you're because the grain size is very so in a can of 3f you might have some grains in there that are as large as 1f and you might have plenty that are even a little smaller but most of them are generally going to be around 3f and i but it's essentially remnants Yes, I, I don't think it's graphite coated either because the grains aren't shiny. Like Swiss powder, it, it is really, really shiny. Skirmish is a dull, it's definitely been tumbled. It's It's been um, glazed, so it is a, a sporty powder, you could say. But, you know, just probably so you can measure out uh, and load it, but it... I don't think it's been graphite glazed, but I've I've shot it and actually the, the skirmish one F I've gotten remarkably yeah. good results with it. Like you know, again, it's just not, not going to be as scientifically meticulously you know, consistent. It's not, it will not be. That's yeah. the key word. It's not consistent. Yeah. It's, it, it, depending on which batch you got, you could you could load ten rounds and you're gonna you'll get a lot of what's called vertical stringing because you're going to get different amounts of pressures based on each charge. So you weigh 60 grains of skirmish um, and you're going to have all different grain sizes in there. Um, you'll, you'll get what's called vertical stringing. And I think that's, that's the lesson, the 19th century lesson to be learned from all this is consistency. Yep. Is that it requires consistency in, in what you do and if you're reenacting, you don't need that consistency. 
No. So skirmish. It's, it's smoke, smoke and fire. Yeah. Um, so I, any I, other I, notes on the different powder brands? No, they're kind of well. Jury's still out for me on Old Ainsford. I know a lot of people really swear by it. Um, and I'm not saying it's a bad powder. And again, I, I use it. But if I, I would rather spend a dollar more a pound and get Swiss. Um, it, I've, I've had such excellent results with Swiss. And the, the beautiful thing is we've exactly match the velocity that they were getting in the 1860s so yeah, the, we've, we've completely nothing says consistency recreated like the same experience that they were getting in the mid 19th century with with the swiss so it's it's not cheap but uh i i prefer it well that's Black powder for modern applications. Yeah, I hope and, that uh, was useful. Um, and I, I hope you learned something and you won't you will look at a pound of 3F the same way again. I think it's open. all still incredibly fascinating. And even even hearing about black powder being used in in modern artillery rounds, that's just so cool to me. So yeah, good old Goix. <laughs> Good old Go X. So that is part one. So we can celebrate with um you're gonna you're gonna like that? <laughs>